Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Come on, let's stand up and let's let's worship the Lord together this morning. Of 
it's not maybe not our hearts, but we've seen it. We've pushed him out. We, we've had comments like, uh, you keep your religion in church. Someone told me that one time. I was like, bless your heart. You don't understand my religion. is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's with me everywhere I go. I can't leave him in church. He dwells in me. What an opportunity. So I want to encourage you. If you're physically able to and you feel so led, we're going to have a time of prayer. And I'm going to ask you to come up front. If you can, you can stay right where you're at, where you're comfortable. But we're going to pray for our country. But we need to start with ourselves, with the body of Christ. Because we need to be a source of light and encouragement in this dark time. And we don't need to be overwhelmed. We've read of many great stories. Daniel got thrown in the lion's den, right? right? God didn't take the lion's den away. Why not? God is glorified in the most awful things. When it looks like all hope is lost, when it looks like there is nothing that can be done, God shows off who he is for his purposes. Amen? Would you join me in prayer? If you feel so late, come up forward. If not, you stay right. I want to encourage you. Pray out loud where you're at. Don't hold back. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, what unites us together here in this church is Jesus Christ. We've put our faith in him. We've put our hope in him. Lord, we were told of the gospel message that the sin that we did, that we are accountable for, that he bore on the cross. Lord, it's a, it's a, it's a miracle that we have salvation, but that's what you provided. You provided a way for us to be reconciled to you, and we are. We're reconciled to you through your son, Jesus Christ, and we are known as children of God. Lord, we are children of the Most High God. Lord, we are ambassadors of the Christ that saved us. <coughs> Lord, and you desire not to just be our Savior or to be our Lord. Jesus says, I call you friend. Lord, we, we're your family. And apart from you, we have no good thing. And Lord, as your body, as, as the bride... As believers, we come before you with one heart and one mind. Lord, our heart aches for our country. Lord, there's hatred and division. Lord, so much hatred that we see that people can't even see clearly. They get so wrapped up into an idea. Lord, we've made leaders our idols. We've made ideas our idols. We've made our country our idol. Lord, we serve you. Let us be about the kingdom of God. Lord, we have a kingdom. It's your kingdom. It's eternal. It's not going anywhere. Everything that we know in this physical world will fade away. But your word endures forever. And Lord, we lift up our country. Lord, I pray that you would use your people in the midst of this darkness to speak truth, to speak hope, to share the gospel of Jesus. Lord, there, there is no Savior other than Jesus Christ. There's no law that will save us. There's no politician that will save us. There's no government that will save us. There is no constitution that will save us. The only hope we have is Jesus, Lord, help us to not be slothful in our walk. Help us to be dedicated to spending time with you, to being in your word, to memorizing your word, to writing your word on the tablet of our heart. So, Lord, that we can speak your word to the world, your wisdom, your love, your long suffering. And Father, let us look to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as how we should act. Lord, give us all the traits of the Spirit. Let them rule. Let us keep in step with the Spirit, Lord. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness faithfulness, 
us not be troubled. Let us not be disheartened. Let us grin in the face of adversity. What a marvelous time we get to be believers in. Lord, let us turn our eyes to heaven just like Stephen and know where our hope lies. Lord, we love you. We're going to worship you. And we're going to serve you with all that we have. In your son's name we pray. Come on and stand with us and let's continue to sing praises to our King as we sing about his faithfulness and the provision he has made for us.
It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Grace is here. Love is triumphed over death. Is your love, is 
Sunday, we kicked off a brand new sermon series, a new journey for a new year, a journey through John's gospel. As we began this study uh, last week, pa Pastor Ian, he covered the first five verses along with verse 14, which are some of my very favorite verses in all of scripture. Those verses declare with absolute certainty who Jesus is. He is the Lord. He is the word made flesh sent to this earth to dwell among men and we have seen his glory glory as the only begotten son of the father full of grace and truth we saw in those verses that Jesus the word he was there with God before the creation of the universe that he was with God that he is God and that all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made what powerful verses John 1 through 5 and verse 14 are and I just as Ian said last week that he does I have pointed many people to this book new Christians searching people folks who are questioning who Christ really is I pointed them to this book because in my opinion there's no 
book in the Bible that does a better job of, of revealing who Jesus is than the book of John. I love this gospel, and so I am excited about the journey that is before us, this, just, this journey that will cover so many details about the life and the ministry of our Savior. It's going to be good. And now with that said, uh, let's get ready to just go ahead and dive in. We've got a lot of ground to cover for today. So do, do you have your Bible with you this morning? Good. Please open it and look with me to John chapter 1, where we will be reading verses 6 through 13. John 1, 6 through 13. And when you get there, say hallelujah. 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 That word, of course, means praise ye the Lord. It is given to us in the imperative form, meaning that it is a command. So we could say it like this. Hey, Misty, you praise the Lord. John, praise the Lord. Leanne, praise the Lord. Miss Ella, praise the Lord. It's a command that we are to praise the Lord. And so that's what we're here to do today. We're here to worship him. We're here to praise him. We're here to pray to him. We're here to open this precious word and hear from him today. And so everybody should be there at our text uh, by now, right? John chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Look with me there. It says that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we, just, we come into your presence today with so much thanksgiving for your love, for your mercy, for your faithfulness to us. And God, we, we have been privileged to be in your presence and just sing your praises today. And God, as we have done that, I pray that you have heard our cry to you and you have been, your heart has just been filled with joy to hear your people sing out about your goodness. And God, now as we come to this time where we open your word, God, I pray that you would pour out your, your message from heaven. Use me as a, as a vessel, God. Just, just, just clear my thoughts, my mind, my, 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 my ambitions, God. Anything that may be of this flesh, God, just move it and let the Holy Spirit of God reign supreme in this place that we may hear from you and see our Savior high and lifted up. Just have your way and we'll thank you for everything you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we learned last week, this book was written by John, the one whom Scripture calls John the Beloved. This is John the disciple, John the apostle. He is the one who authored this book. And when we get to verse 6, there we are introduced to a man named John. But understand, this is not the author talking about himself. He's, he, he's speaking of another John here. John the apostle is introducing us to John the baptizer. And when we get to verse 6, we see an abrupt change take place in the narrative coming out of verse 5. And I want us to, to look at this. And for the sake of context and continuity, we're going to go back and read again. And I, and I actually want to go back to the beginning of this book. And I want to reread the whole first 14 verses of our text, of the text. Now, our verses for today are 6 through 13, and that's what we're going to concentrate on are those verses. But, but, but before we do, I want to read through all, first four, all the first 14 verses so that we can see the flow and try to wrap our minds around what the apostle is telling us in these early verses of his gospel. So look with me at the very beginning of this book. It says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word 
word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John, he, he begins by talking about Jesus being the word, being with God, about him being God. He tells us that he is the creator of all things. And in verse 4, John tells us that, that Jesus is the light A light that shines in the darkness. A light that cannot be overcome by the darkness. This is the essence of the gospel ministry. The Lord Jesus, he he gives his light to all those who call on him as Savior. And, And through them, through those who believe in Jesus, the illuminating light of Christ is sent forth, pinning and penetrating into the darkness of this world. And that's what we're we're called to do. And not just called, that's what we're commissioned. We are appointed with the task of being a witness for Christ so that the light of Christ may shine into every corner of the world. The Apostle John, he he knew this. He understood that that being a witness for Christ was imperative for the Christian faith. And I call your attention to this because without understanding what John was saying and what he's pointing out in these opening verses of his his gospel, verse 6 just seems to come out of nowhere because at verse 6 there's just this sudden shift in the storyline. But when John makes this abrupt change, it's not coming from out in the left field somewhere. Uh, He's not getting sidetracked, not chasing a bunny trail. That's not what's going on. It's it's exactly opposite of that. Verse 6 was written very intentionally. Look at verses 6 and 7. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that that all might believe through him. You see what he does here? He says, there was a man who was sent from God, a man who was sent to bear witness about the light that he was just telling us about. There's this light, and then God sent this man to bear witness about this light. And when we pick up here at verse 6, we are intentionally and purposefully introduced to John the Baptist. Up to this point, we've been reading about the uncreated one. We've been reading about the one who was with God before the creation, the one who created all things. He is life itself. He gives life to all things, and and his life is the light of the world. And we just came out of the Christmas season where we spent weeks talking about looking at the coming of the Christ into the world. We, we, We spoke of the hundreds of prophecies that foretold his coming. We talked about the significance of his coming. We 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 talked about how, how his coming forever changed the course of history. God became flesh, and he dwelt among us. That's what we see in verses 1 through 5. That's what they're talking about. And then we have this shift to verse 6. And this storyline shifts from Jesus, from the Word made flesh, to a man, a regular guy, just like me and you, mortal flesh. Now, through the Through the course of this gospel, the author is going to show us a lot of things. He's going to give us a a lot of testimony to Christ. He's going to point to the testimony of God himself. He's going to point to the words and to the works of Jesus. He's going to point to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. He's going to point to the testimony of eyewitnesses of his miracles, to the testimony of his disciples. John's going to give us a, a whole lot of evidence in this gospel to show us that verse 14 is true, that the eternal word of God did in fact become flesh and dwell on earth among mankind. And John begins this whole testimony by pointing to the testimony that comes from this man, this guy that we know as John the Baptizer. John got his title Baptizer because of his ministry of baptizing people in the Jordan River. He wandered around in the wilderness continuously with a great passion preaching to people declaring that the Messiah was coming, that that they needed to repent of their sins, to turn away from their wicked ways. And when a person would do that, when they would repent of their sin, John would baptize them in, in a symbolic action of being washed and cleansed from their sin. And, you know, we do the same thing today. 
We practice the same thing. When a person comes to faith in Jesus, when they repent of their sins, when they trust in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we will baptize them. We'll take them somewhere. We'll find some water somewhere, whether it be up here, whether it be at the aquatic center, whether it be at Ian's pool, whether we have to take them to the river, we find a pond. If it's in a mountain stream or a jungle river like I've done in the mission field, we'll find some water somewhere. We'll baptize them as followers of Jesus Christ. And next week, Pastor Mark, he's going to cover baptism in greater detail Uh, He'll talk about what it means and the significance of it because baptism is a key theme in next week's text. So I'm not going to pre-preach his message for him, although he did try to do that for me in his prayer today. I think he was reading my notes before he prayed this morning. But but that's what John did. John, he, he went around baptizing people as believers in Christ. So that's how he acquired his name, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And here's something else interesting and unique about John the Baptist. And I've preached this text before. I've I've heard people preach this text before. But I'd never really thought about this, never really heard of this until I was preparing for, for this message. And somewhere in my studies, I read it. But John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Even though he actually appears to us here in the New Testament, John and his ministry comes according to the order of the Old Testament prophets, one who comes before and declares the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. And we can read about John John the Baptizer in in the early chapters of all four Gospels. Uh, They all show him as in, in his role as an Old Testament prophet coming before and preparing the way of the Lord. Matthew verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins and the gospel of luke it actually begins with the foretelling of john showing us that he that that he was not only a prophet who would who would come and prepare the way for the lord but he was also a relative of jesus a cousin of jesus he was born to mary's cousin elizabeth and her husband the temple priest zechariah we talk about this in the christmas season and john John the Baptist is the baby who leapt in his mother's womb at the visitation of Mary in, in Luke 141. And, and I know we did just read this at Christmas, but, but I want to read it to you again because this is good stuff right here. L- listen to Luke 1, 39 through 45. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judea. And, and, and she entered into the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me, get this, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped with joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And if you remember, when Zechariah was visited and told by the angel that he and his aged wife were going to have a son, with Zechariah in, in a state of disbelief, he questioned what the angel was telling him and therefore Zechariah was struck mute unable to speak for the duration of his wife's pregnancy but then once the child was born and they reached those customary that customary eighth day when when a child was to be named according to Jewish tradition at that point Zechariah is finally once again able to speak and he makes the proclamation that the boy's name would be John and this was in accordance with the instruction that he was given by the angel some 10 months before. And once John is born I want you to listen to what 
what Zechariah says after the birth of his son. Luke 1, 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And then... Zechariah looking at his son, looking at John, he, the old priest says this, and you, child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. See, when we read the words of John 1, 6, don't miss the massive significance that is weaved in the simple wording of it, that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Sent by God, named by God, given a special assignment by God to go before and prepare the way for the promised one, that long-awaited Messiah. And when you think about that, when you think about why John was sent, there's never been a mortal man with a greater significance of a, of, of a, a greater responsibility, I'm sorry. Never been a man with a greater responsibility. Never been a more with a, with a greater privilege. John was sent to introduce the world to its Savior. And here at the beginning of John, in, in verse 6, John the Apostle, he introduces us to John the Baptist and specifically pointing out his ministry, a ministry that is defined in verse 7, which says, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Here in this verse, we not only see the purpose of John's ministry, but we can also see the purpose of every gospel ministry, to bear witness about the light that all might believe in him. That that's what the apostle is showing us here. This was, this was John's purpose, to lead people to faith, to lead people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And following after the example of John, Leading people to faith in Jesus is the mission of every believer. It's the responsibility of every believer. Not, not that we can make anybody believe. We know that that's the job of the Holy Spirit. But we have a purpose. We have a responsibility to point folks to him, to show people that this is the Christ. And in the coming weeks, we're going to see this on the pages of Scripture of this book. We're going to, we're going to see people doing just that. When we get to verses 40 and 40 through 42 of this chapter, we're going to see Andrew hear the testimony of John the Baptist, and, and he's going to begin to follow Jesus. And, and, and when he begins to follow Jesus, Andrew, he goes and he finds his brother Simon, that guy who Jesus is going to rename Peter. And he goes to him and he says, says to his brother, uh, Simon, we have found the Messiah. He pointed him to him. He, he pointed his brother to Jesus. And then in verse, the next few verses, 43 through 45, we're going to see Philip. He begins to follow Christ. And once he does, he immediately goes and he finds his friend Nathaniel. And he says to him, we have found him who Moses and the law and the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now again, we're, we're going to get to all these verses over the coming weeks, so I'm not going to pre-preach them either. But, but I do want us to see the model that is given for us in Scripture. Believers in Christ, we have the responsibility and the privilege of pointing others to him. We are to follow after what we see here in the life of John the Baptist. We're to bear witness about the light that all might believe in him. And that's what John was sent to do. He had a God-appointed role to play in God's redemptive plan. And just like the Lord Jesus, John was also prophesied about. It had been foretold for hundreds of years before that, that there would be a forerunner, that there would be one who came to prepare the way of the Lord. And not only that, but the birth of John was 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 also a miraculous birth 
Like Jesus had a miraculous birth. No, no, John was not born of a virgin. We know that there's only one son of the Most High. There's only been one miraculous conception. But, but John was born to parents who were well beyond the typical childbearing years. I mean, that's exactly what Zechariah said when he questioned the angel in Luke 1.18. He says, how can this be? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Now, we don't know exactly how old uh, they were when Elizabeth conceived but many historians and Bible scholars believe that they may have been in their 80s if not older at the time that, 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 that John came along and, and, and that would put them right up there close to Abraham and Sarah when Isaac was conceived they were old. They were well beyond the, the age of childbearing. They had, they had never been able to get pregnant, and they had long since given up any hope of having any children. So John is miraculously conceived, which just further points to the fact that he was sent by God. And when we come to this, this text, beginning at verse 6, we are introduced to the prophesied forerunner of Christ. He's bold. He's filled with the power of God. But he is a man, a regular mortal man. And that's the contrast of these two characters that we see in the narrative at the beginning of this book. The Lord Jesus is eternal He's from before creation. God, uh, John is a created being. He came into existence at this appointed time. Jesus is God. John was sent by God. Verse 7 says, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. John was sent to bear witness, to testify about the light, but he was not the light. Verse 8 he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Uh, again, he's, he's, he's repeating these words. So here's the synopsis of John 1, 6 through 8. God sent a man named John to lead the way, to announce to the world that the long-awaited Messiah was here. John was not the Messiah, not the light, but he was sent as God's spokesman to point people to the light. At the very start of his gospel, John points out the nature of true gospel ministry. See, all true ministers, all true believers, all faithful witnesses, they center their message, they center their testimony on the evidence and the facts concerning Christ. They make a big deal of Jesus. They bear witness about who he is and, the, and, the, and they bear witness that he is who the scriptures say that he is. And this is the theme of all biblical preaching, to make big of Jesus. Ministers aren't priests, not according to what the Bible considers a priest. We're not a priest. We're not mediators between man and God. We're not special agent Christians who've been somehow, somehow gained some greater power, some greater wisdom than, than everybody else that we can just distribute to all of you. We're, we're just regular mortal men who, who have the same kinds of problems and struggles that you do. And the truth is, anything that we share with you through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can find those exact same truths out for yourself. Those same challenging, those same life-changing truths, you can find them for yourselves without us at all because God doesn't need any of us. His Spirit can lead you, direct you, teach you, train you, and show you these things. And I know this is going to shock some of you, but, but you pastors, we're not all-knowing. We, we don't have special powers. We're, we're not miracle workers. We don't have the ability to heal the sick and raise the dead. God alone can do those things. Sure, we, we, we can pray for you. We can lay hands on you. We can anoint you with oil. We can pray. We can follow the commands of Scripture, believing that God can heal anyone he wants to, anytime he wants to. But there's not a person on the earth who has the ability to do those things. Only God can heal. Only God can give life. Nowhere in Scripture are we shown where a minister or any other follower of Jesus is anointed with some supernatural power above everybody else. Because 
that, that thought is completely contradictory to the teaching of the Bible because, because what it would do is it would, it would cause the exact opposite of what the purpose of the gospel is. Remember, the purpose of the gospel, and not just the gospel, but, but the expressed role of the Holy Spirit himself is to make big of Christ. To, to make big of Jesus. So, so if somebody's got these powers and they're getting the attention, it takes away from what the point of the Scripture is to point to Jesus, to make a big deal of Jesus. So not to have somebody else getting noticed. Listen to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. John 16, verses 13 through 15. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And old Charles Spurgeon, in commenting on this very passage, on these words, he says, it is the chief office of the Holy Spirit to glorify Christ. He does many things, but this is what he aims at in all of them, to glorify Christ. Brethren, what the Holy Ghost does must be right for us to imitate. Therefore, let us endeavor to glorify Christ to whatever ends... To, 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 I'm sorry, to what higher ends can we devote ourselves than to the same work of the, that is of the Holy Spirit that he devotes himself to? All true workings of God, all true ministries, all true ministers, all true witnesses of God, they all work to accomplish one thing, to make a big deal of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give testimony of the one light who alone dispels the darkness. It's to point to him. That's why when you come to church here, you're going to find Jesus is the big deal. Not your pastor's. Not the musicians or, or the singers, not our teachers or our volunteers. Hey, we are blessed. We are thankful for all of you. We have some of the most amazing, most talented, most gifted, most faithful folks who, who we love dearly. But as gifted as you are, as thankful as we are, as loved as you are, you are not the big deal. We're going to make a big deal out of Jesus. We're going to point to Jesus. He's the big deal. So, so. We're going to praise Jesus. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to call on the name of Jesus. We're going to take all of our gifts, all of our talents, all of our energy, all of our resources, and by the grace of God, we're going to use it all to point to Jesus. Church, what we're going to do here at Three Rivers Church is we're going to work as hard as we can as faithfully as we can to point people to Jesus, to bear witness about the light that all men might believe in him. Why? Because it doesn't matter if people love your pastors and our amazing personalities. It doesn't matter if people love the music we play and the songs that we sing. It doesn't matter if we have the greatest volunteers in all of Christendom if they miss Jesus. None of that matters. There's one mediator between man and God. There's one way to salvation. And if we don't make big of Christ, if we aren't careful and intentional about preaching his gospel, then people will come into this place and they will leave and they may feel happy and they may, they, they may be all feeling great, but they will leave just like they came in with no change in their life whatsoever because Jesus is the only one who can change hearts and lives. And oh, how the hearts of, and lives of people in the world today need to be changed by the power of Christ oh how people need to be overwhelmed by the love of God oh how people need to trust in Jesus and surrender to him and be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that they can live for him I mean, looking back at, at the things that have taken place in, in our nation over these last few years and what has is, what is transpired even over this past week, oh, how we need a people whose lives display the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, how we need a people who will rise up and their lives will bubble over 
Just pour over with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you think we could use some of that in the world today? Well, the only way it can happen is by people coming to faith in, by people trusting in and surrendering their lives to the Lord Jesus. And how does that happen? In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And who is the Word of God? Man, we saw this last week. Jesus, he is the Word made flesh. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. We must and we will make a big deal about Jesus because it's all about him. The Lord Jesus has to be the big deal in his church. We have to make much of him. We have to make much of his word. We have to boldly and unashamedly proclaim his gospel to all who will listen. Why? Because if people are not introduced to the word of God, if they never hear the gospel message, they cannot be saved. They cannot find a way out of the condemnation of their sin. Romans 10, 12 through 15, the apostle Paul writes, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You know, that's been my prayer now for a number of years. Over the years of my ministry, and understand, I, I don't say this in any kind of braggadocious way at all. Not, not, not at all. I, I say this with I say this with the utmost humility and reverence, and thankfulness, and just utter amazement. I, I don't know why God would ever use me. I don't know why He would give me the opportunities He has. But over the years of my ministry, I've been blessed to sing or speak on literally hundreds of stages and platforms to thousands of people. Been on numerous mission trips, both here in these states and places all around the world. And through all of that, this has become my prayer. God, I, I don't care if these people like me. I don't care if they're impressed with me. Uh, it doesn't matter if they like the way I sing or, or how I preach, but God, when I leave this place, may they be able to say of me, he's got beautiful feet. How beautiful are the feet of the one who preaches the good news. God, help me to be faithful to boldly proclaim the gospel of my Lord. God, use me how, however you see fit to point people Jesus to bear witness about this light that others may believe in him it's not it's not possible to overemphasize the significance of this truth God's people have been given the honor and the responsibility to bear witness to this light just like John the Baptist did and I could go on and on about this. I could preach a whole other message out of, this, for, out of verses 6 through 8 on our responsibility to be a witness for Christ. But, but I think you get it. I think, I think you're there with me, so we'll move on. We've only covered three of the eight verses we're supposed to cover, so let's move on. Look at verse 9. It says, The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. When Christ appeared on the scene... The second part of the Trinity becomes clear. Before the incarnation, his identity was a mystery, but now, now we can see who he is. 
And in this introduction to his gospel, John, he points out to us that Jesus was there before the beginning, that he is the creator of all things. And, and when you study your Bible, you can, you can see from passages in both the Old and the New Testaments that, that Jesus has been there all along, moving and working throughout the course of history. We know, we know that he's the Savior who was prophesied of old. We know that he is the one whom Isaiah wrote about, whose name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We know that he is the one who would be our substitute as he took his, the, the penalty of our sin upon himself and he, and he died on the cross for him. We know this. We know who he is. Is, but before the incarnation, his identity was, identity was a mystery. They were looking and they were waiting and they were wondering, but nobody knew who he was going to be. There was this dark shadow that hid who he was. But then we come to the New Testament and we see the Lord come on the scene. And then all of a sudden, the light drives away the shadow. All of a sudden, Jesus, his light, it illuminates himself, and we see the light of the glory of God in Jesus like never before. This is the true light. The glory of God shines in him more brilliantly than anything else in all of Scripture. And as he shines, he enlightens everyone who sees him for who he is. Now, what does that mean, enlightens everyone? What it means is for every person who truly sees Christ, who really gets a glimpse of his light, there is an understanding given about who he is. This couldn't happen in the Old Testament. No one could see the glory of Christ until he actually came into the world. But after he did appear, he's now known. And his light... It shines, his marvelous light, it shines, and he is the only light for mankind. Everyone who is enlightened is enlightened by him. Everyone who is saved is saved by him. You, you can't be saved apart from Christ. John, he, he later nails this down in John 8, 12, and he says, where, where he said, well, Jesus, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus his light is the only sufficient light for the world. He is the only light that the world has. And the 19th century theologian, J.C. Ryle, he put it this way. Christ is to the souls of men what the sun is to the world. He is the center and the source of all spiritual light. Like the sun... He shines for the common benefit of all mankind, for high and for low, for rich and for poor, for Jew and for Greek. Like the sun, he is free to all. All may look at him and drink health out of his light. If millions of mankind were mad enough to dwell in caves underground or to bandage their eyes, their darkness would be their own fault and not the fault of the sun. So likewise... If millions of men and women love spiritual darkness rather than light, the blame must be laid on their blind hearts. But whether men will see or not, Christ is the true Son and the light of the world. There is no light for sinners except for the Lord Jesus. What a profound statement. As the Son is the light that lights the world, so Christ is the light that lights the souls of men. There's no other light. If you accept this light, you're saved. But if you reject this light, you're judged. Verse 10. He was in the world. The world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. Jesus was in the world for 33 years. For 33 years, the Creator was physically present with his creation. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He demonstrated his power over nature. Jesus put himself on full display, proving who he was while he walk, walked on the earth that he created. But it says the world did not know him. They didn't recognize him. They refused to see the light that was shining 
before their eyes. You know, never has the depravity of man, deprav- depravity, depravity, would be how you say that, right? <laughs> never is the depravity, I'm making up words as I go, never is the depravity of man more evident than when he turns away from the light. The light came into the world and it shined, exposing the darkness of humanity, and yet many turn away and refuse to let the light drive the darkness from within them. How wretched man really is, how sad, how disastrous it is when someone rejects the Lord Jesus. It says there in verse 10 that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. The world didn't know him. The world did not know its own creator. Consumed by the passions of this world, plagued by spiritual blindness, in, in, in love with their sin, the world refuses to see the light that shines before them. And John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, this is just three verses after the most well-known and beloved verse in all of Scripture. We all know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What amazing, encouraging words. But three verses later, beginning of verse 19, Jesus said, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked thing, things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The people love what? The darkness rather than the light. And therefore they reject God's Son and they just plunge deeper and deeper into the darkness of their lives. You see, to those who are perishing, the light is foolish. It's senseless, and so they they turn away from it, and they run to the familiar comfort of the darkness, the darkness that will ultimately be their destruction. Man, there's tons of evidence out as to the depth of human depravity. Just turn on the evening news. Just turn on the news tonight, come out of Jacksonville. See the evil, wicked hearts of man come bubbling to the surface. Pick up a history book. Begin to read. It don't matter what point of history. Just just pick up a history book. Open a page and start reading. Human history is marred by evil, by sin, by wickedness. But, But never, never is the depth of human depravity more clear than when people hear the truth of Christ, when they have the light of the world shine on them and they reject him. And it even goes beyond that. Look at verse 11. It says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own. Now, what does it mean that he came to his own? It means he came to his own. He came to his own people, his own country, his own nation, his own town, to those who were his own people, and they did not receive him. This wasn't just the Gentile world. It wasn't just the outside world. It was the very people who claimed to believe in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were the most religious people on the planet, and they did not receive him. This is one of the saddest illustrations the chosen people of God the nation of Israel the ones to whom the promise and the prophecies had been given they rejected their long awaited Messiah he came into his own and his own people did not receive him how sad how heartbreaking how tragic But thankfully, God's redemptive plan could not be stopped by those who reject him. Look at verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. What does it mean to receive him? Well, the next sentence answers that. It says, believe in his name. Now, that phrase, believe in his name, it appears three times in John's gospel. Here in verse 12, 
in chapter 2 verse 23 and chapter 3 verse 18 and when this phrase is used it does not mean to just believe in the in the name by which he is called but it believe but it means to believe in what his name stands for Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation that's what the name Jesus means Yahweh saves Yahweh is salvation so in context what this phrase believe in his name means is to believe that Jesus is the word of God made flesh that he is the light of the world that he is the Christ that he is the only son of almighty God that he is the one and only savior of the world And if you will believe that, if you will put all of your hope, all of your trust, all of your faith in that, then you are given the right to become a child of God. By believing in Jesus Christ, undeserving sinners like like you and like me, we are, are given the right to become members of God's family with full and legitimate rights as heirs to the kingdom of God can 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 we just pause here for for a second and acknowledge just how incredible how unbelievable it is that a holy and righteous God would offer to us a path not only of forgiveness for our sins but to be adopted into his family to be counted as his children do you get how crazy that is we're just pure wickedness do you understand just how massive the words of John 3 16 really are no wonder John Newton described it as amazing grace that saved a wretch like me no wonder Charles Gabriel penned those words I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me just a sinner condemned unclean alas and did my savior bleed did my sovereign die here we talked about this just the other day would he devote that sacred head for such a worm amazing love his amazing unbelievable mercy and grace is why we can sing these resounding themes like we sang this morning his love is higher than the skies up above deeper than what I can dream of his love is the greatest of all Twelve says, but to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. What a verse. What an overwhelming truth. In verse 13, and let me read 12 and 13 together. But to all who did believe in him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who were born? How he starts that verse off. To be a child, you have to be born, right? And John John just said that we can become the children of God. And you have to be born to be a child. So how can we be born into God's family? Well, he answers that, and he says, not of blood. This is not a physical birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's being born again. And this is also something that we'll address in greater detail later when we get to chapter 3. But there, Jesus tells Nicodemus that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, you must be born again. In verse 13, he says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Not born of blood. This is not a physical birth. Not born of the will of the flesh. That is, not by your personal effort. You cannot do it. 
And then it says, not by the will of man. Being born again is not something that any man can accomplish of his own will or desire. You cannot save yourself. It is not something that you can do, and it's not something that any other person can do for you. Every one of us, each person, must individually trust in Jesus for themselves. Man, I've asked people that. Are you a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me about your salvation experience. Well, I've always been a Christian. Wrong answer. Nobody's always been a Christian. And the prophet Jeremiah, he, 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 he kills that. The heart of man is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things who can know it. No, you've not always been a Christian. Tell me about when you met Jesus. My dad was a pastor. Doesn't matter. God don't have grandchildren. You don't ride in on somebody else's coattail. Every one of us must make the decision for ourselves to trust in Christ. And the, the last three words of this, uh, of verse 13 says, but of God, salvation, being born again into God's family, it is a gift to be received. It's not a reward. It's not something that you can earn. It's not something that you can achieve. It is a gift, and it is the most precious gift of all, and it is offered to you. He stretches out his hands to you. The question is, will you receive it? Will you, by faith, reach out and take the gift that the Lord offers to you? The choice is yours. What will you do? Would you pray with me? Father, God, again, I am, I am so excited about this journey that we are embarking on, oh, God, this, this, this walk through the Gospel of John where we see the story of our Savior unfold, where we hear the testimony of those who walked with him on the earth and saw firsthand his workings, his healings, who heard firsthand his teachings. God, to hear the testimony of your Holy Spirit that proclaims that this is the Christ. To hear your own testimony where you, where you open up the heavens and your word resounds, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, God. We look forward to walking through this journey and seeing our Savior put on display before us. And God, for those of us who are in Christ, who have trusted in him, God, I pray that this would be an encouragement to us that we are reminded of the price that was paid for our redemption and the hope that we have in you that, that, we, that we will realize Lord, that with all the turmoil and the, and the uncertainty and all the, the junk that's going on in this evil world around us our hope is in Christ Jesus he is our Lord he is our master he forever will be on the throne and he cannot fail and Lord no matter what this world may throw at us we have a home awaiting where we will be in your presence forever and ever apart from all of this, this, this mess of the world the pain and the sorrow and the suffering it'll all be gone and we'll be in your presence forever with you help us to rejoice in that even today Lord Jesus and God I do pray that if there be even one in this place today who has never never done that who has never trusted in the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior Oh, God, I pray that you'd work the miracle of salvation in their life today. God, I pray that through your precious word and through the words that you have said through me, and God, I pray that I have honored you, that I have been true to your word in everything that I've said. And God, I pray that through, 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 through what you've spoken today, Lord, that they will see the truth of Jesus, who he is, and the significance that he is the one and only way to God the Father. And Lord, I just pray that you would draw them to you Help them to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, surrender their lives to him, and be saved forever. And God, for all of us, 
as we leave this place today, I pray that we would leave with the name of Jesus on our lips. That we would be intentional about sharing his love with this world because this world needs to hear the message. Your people need to be reminded of our task and our responsibility to shine his light to even the darkest corners of the world. Help us to shine our light that others may see our works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. Be with us now, God, as we uh, close our time together and we sing this final song. And Lord, I just pray that once again you would help your people to sing your praises and that you would listen in and let it bring joy to your heart. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love that never fails. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rumors of the Son of Man, stories of the Savior. tonight at five as well and this is the first uh, kind of normal week where everything is as it has been in the past men to men and women to women tomorrow night uh, praise team practice on tuesday awana on wednesday and uh there's a new study starting for the ladies tomorrow night called fighting hold on i can it's uh i need stronger reading glasses Forgive, uh, yeah, forgiving what you can't forget. It looks like I say forgetting what I can't read. That's what it really is. Uh, forgiving what you can't forget. That uh, starts tomorrow night. See Angela for questions about that. And then on Thursday, the 14th, a new study, uh, Experiencing God, or it might not be a new study, but a continuation at least. New study, brand new. You will experience God in new and incredible ways, uh, but only on Zoom. 
So see Teresa for that. Uh, you can do that at the comfort of your home in your PJs, as long as you look presentable from maybe the shoulders up. <laughs> On February 21st, we're going to have a child or baby dedication. And if your kid, you know, he can be 18, 19, 20 years old. If you've never dedicated them to the Lord, we'll, we'll dedicate those guys. I don't care if they're shaving or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll dedicate them. But uh, February 21st, if you would like to see your child dedicated to the Lord, uh, we would be delighted to do that. Uh, do that February 21st. Please email Vicki in the office, and we'll get that all squared away. Anything that I'm forgetting? Yes, Teresa. Teresa. Uh, just remember that Michigan Methodist Church has a new time slot. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot. It starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, A.M. No. no, not. I'm typically here. Uh, uh, six o'clock at night. Six o'clock. That's a new starting time, so that'll uh, bring folks in on Monday nights. Uh, new starting. That means you get uh, get done a little bit quicker, and then you can go home. Perfect. Thank you. I forgot about that. That's six o'clock, and then Bible study tonight is also the new time at five o'clock. So that you can get home in a reasonable time. So we're not driving uh, late, late at night. Anything else I missed? New times? Just everything you want to know is right here in the current. If you don't get one, see Vicki. Vicki is the go-to person this week. Just see Vicki for everything. Need tax help? See Vicki. <laughs> Car making funny noise? See Vicki. Having trouble keeping your plants alive? See Vicki. Call Vicki. Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Y'all pray for our church. Uh, our church, I'm talking to the church at large. May we be bold in our witness, confident and strong in who Jesus is. Don't forget that fact. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. Lord, thankful that we can still hear worship and praise you openly with no shame, with no secrecy. Lord, we will not Stop the message that is found in Jesus. Lord, as we dig through the Gospel of John, we will get to know you more and more. Get to know you more intimately and see your character and who you are. And Lord, I can't help uh, but be excited about the transformation that you will do in each of us as we can be confident in who you are, knowing for sure that what you say is true. You will not leave us, you will not forsake us. You are with us always. So, Lord, let us go boldly out in this community, sharing the gospel of hope with our friends, family, our coworkers, our classmates, Lord, all that we come into contact with. And, Lord, may your name be magnified, glorified because of who you are. Lord, let us be doers of your word, not hearers only. In Jesus' name.